nice and cool out there. We got some new faces here today. Not new, but we've got an interesting group sitting on this side, so uh, praise the Lord for that. Today's going to be a special day. We'll get into that as we go, but I won't hesitate any longer. I'll go ahead and let Sister come on. Kick them in. Please be in prayer for Tony this morning. He's feeling a little bit under the weather, so you've got me. And we're, the first thing I'm going to do is change things. <clears throat> so our call to worship in the bulletin is Hosanna, but I want you to get your hymn book and turn to page 22. We're going to bless his holy name this morning, and we're going to sing the chorus of the song, which comes first. Go right into verse 1, and then go back to the chorus and end it. Dear Lord, we bless your holy name this morning and just bring us into the season of worship this morning as Brother Rusty comes to us and leads us in his message this morning. Bless our singing. Bless us overall. For we ask these things in our son's name. Amen. Okay. I was getting ready to sit down, but I'm not sitting down yet. Okay, let's turn to uh, number three in our hymn books. Worthy of Worship. Oh, my 
Good morning. When I do a um, devotional up here or whatever it happens to be, reading scripture, I try to think of everybody in the church and I and make an assessment of the general population because I agonize over doing this and I want if if I'm going to do it, I hope that I that it it means something to everybody. And as I was looking through um, uh, various devotionals, I, I finally came across one that suited me, and its title was How to Succeed in All Things. I thought, yeah, it's all right with me. I, I would like to do that, and I imagine other people would like to succeed in all things, or maybe some things anyway. So, so I went on to look, and... It tells, it, it, it says, if you want to succeed at what you do, it is vital that we invite God to be in charge of the project. Well, I thought, okay, what else is there, you know? <laughs> it, it said the most important thing this is, was its topic sentence. You kids know all about topic sentences. So uh, we do need to uh, put God in charge of whatever we do. But I don't know what kind of person you are, but I think I can do everything. I, I do it myself. And, uh, and then, you know, I fall. Um, I'm disappointed. So I step back a little bit, and I, and I say, Lord, I always forget seek you first and I get I've always done it so I guess I'll always do it um, but uh, I try not to do it but uh, if I'm driving down the road and somebody almost uh, uh, plows into me I don't say oh Lord you know I just sit there just you know uh, nervous and uh, scared to death but and then I say then I say thank you Lord for keeping me safe but I can never do it preemptively. Um, um, if we want to uh, build a business or build a relationship or even rebuild uh, a failed marriage or, or any other type of friendship or anything like that, our labor will be in vain unless God is the head of the building committee. So I, I thought about that, and I thought, well, what do we do if he's not the head of the building committee? Well, there's something we can do. We've got to step back and make an assessment. Think about our life and, and what we're trying to accomplish. And, and the main thing is, are we trying to do things that... We have not invited God to be a part of, so we need to always invite him first and then step out and do our project. Um, if you're struggling and you're frustrated because things are not working, uh, you just don't know what to do, well, there's somebody for you. God is waiting to be invited to help, and all we need to do is ask him. But ask him first. Don't, don't be like I am. The scripture that I have to go with this is uh, from Psalms 127.1. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. So let's, let's keep the Lord building the house and watching over the city. If you get your hymn books again, we're going to turn to page 502, Open My Eyes That I May See. And on the third verse, I'll ask the choir to go down and our ushers to come forward.
Tori Pernia. cell phone here let's see click I'm on can you hear me all right good good morning great looking crowd this morning y'all excited to be here are you excited enough to amen me while I preach and maybe take up another offering we'll go home early <laughs> I got an amen there anyway um, and I think it was a treasure so there you go well this morning we have a special occasion we are recognizing the service of one of our deacons now we won't do anything till the end but I want to show you um, what we have for him what's what's amazing about this is I went off and left it at the house today um, but my daughter and son were on their way and so we were able to call them and get that get them to bring this uh, Deacon Emeritus Harold Robinson uh, we have a plaque for him that's going to be part of our celebration as we're here today but I want to talk to you first about why would we do something like that or, or what's the thought process behind that and what does that mean um, we have I think in the course of this church as far as I understand from talking to brother Bill before he passed away we've had three deacon emeritus um, here uh, one was a carsoner of course <laughs> and then um, just last year, Brother Dick Polly, um, and he has passed away since. And so uh, we're praying for you, brother. <laughs> so this morning, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter, should we just stop right now, right? <laughs> Cancel this, right? Yeah. It's like when somebody walks down the aisle and they want to rededicate their life. I'm always afraid I'll never see them again. That's how that goes. Well, on our way to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and if you're wondering where that's at, that's right after 1 Timothy, as you're looking for that. If you find the T's in the New Testament, you're going to be really close. They're all right there together. So this, this person that we're looking at, obviously we're, we're going to be looking at the writings of Paul, 2 Timothy. So just to put you in the mindset of Paul, Paul was in captivity at this point he was in he was in prison he was soon to leave this world he knew that you could tell by his writing that he knew that and and so keeping that in mind that this is Paul's closing book in the New Testament what he has to say is really 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 important to him he wants to get some things said get some things known and so when we get to chapter 4 we're going to look at one particular person in there in Paul's kind of situation but before we get there the person we're going to look at is, is known by a couple names. He's known as Mark. He's known as John Mark. Um, we see that represented several times. Uh, but before we get there, he actually traveled with Paul and Barnabas. When they went out on their first, on, out on a missionary journey, John Mark went with them. 
Well, they got to a place of Pamphylia, and Cyprus had been a dry run for them. They had one convert in Cyprus, and so I don't know if the work was really too much for John Mark. Um, some people suspect, you know the dude that ran out of his gown in the Garden of Gethsemane and ran off into the woods unclothed? Um, people suspect that that's who that is, that person. It's also suspected this same person wrote the Gospel of Mark who he got that probably dictated to him and told him by the Apostle Peter. So Mark plays a role in a lot of, but he doesn't really play a, a headlining role. He's, he's, not, he's not Luke. Um, he's not John of the Gospel of John. He's not Paul. He's not Peter. But he's always there. As a matter of fact, when Barnabas and Paul went out on their missionary journey, um, John Mark is mentioned there. Now, he is related to Barnabas. And so... That may give you a clue on why he got to go with them on the first missionary journey because he was related to Barnabas, one of the headliners of the tour, right? And he got to go with them, got to Pamphylia, and he kind of bailed on them. But what's mentioned is he went with them, and the word that's used is as an under rower. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with under rowers, but you remember that you've all seen movies where you've got all these guys... In, in the belly of a boat, and they got the rows run out, and they're all rowing, right? And they're, you know, a lot of times the older movies are rowing to the beat of a drum, right? The drum's beating, they're rowing. It's, it's, it's hard, it's thankless. you got a captain up there who's steering the ship and telling you what side to row on harder and things like that. And a lot of these guys were slaves. And so they were in chains, but they were rowing to move these ships. A lot of times in war, they're chained. If the ship goes down, guess what? They get to go down with it as part of their passage fee, I suspect. So, John Mark is mentioned as an under rower. See, an under rower is a person that is in basically a thankless position, but they make things happen. Amen? That's just kind of what we gather from Scripture. And so, looking back at John Mark, well, if you go back in, into Acts chapter 12, you'll see that the people were meeting and they were praying. Remember the little girl, Rhoda, that when Peter showed up and started speaking, she didn't open the door. She ran back and told all the, the Baptist believers that were in there praying. I say they're Baptists because she went back and said, somebody's at the door and it sounds a lot like Peter. And, and of course, the Baptists had been praying all along, said, can't be. And what were they praying for? His release. Peter shows up. They're praying for release. He shows up. They didn't believe their prayers were answered. So they said it must be a spirit, you know, because they knew that he was going to be killed. And they thought there's no way he's going to get out of jail, except an angel showed up and released Peter. Matter of fact, Peter was confidently sleeping in jail prior to being killed. He was asleep. Is that a man of faith or what? So much so that when the angel came to release him, he had to kick him to wake him up. Get up. Get dressed. Let's go. And Peter thought, oh, okay, I'm dreaming this, whatever, I'll follow the angel. They get to a gate, the gate opens, it goes on, and when he gets out and he comes to himself, he realizes this has actually happened. So he goes to Mary's house. Now, this Mary happens to be the mother of John Mark, and she owned her own home. So, she's a woman of prestige, a woman of power, maybe wealth. Maybe that paints a little bit more of a picture of John Mark, is he might have been just a little bit spoiled. Y'all ever met a spoiled child? No? You ever created one? Well, John Mark may have been that. Yeah, you ever seen somebody that's never worked hard have to work hard? And they're not expecting it? It's like, really? Y'all do this eight hours a day? Sometimes 10, sometimes 12, and they can't get through the first hour. I can remember the first time I was helping a carpenter that I'm, I, was, I'm no, I, I was no carpenter. I, I had no idea. I could bend nails with the best of them, but as far as drive them. And we went to put a lintel in over a garage, a two-car garage. And so we was holding up this tube of 12, the two of us, and then we were setting nails in it, and we were hammering up. And I couldn't figure out how we held the board, held the nail, and held the hammer all at the same time without dropping it and killing one another while this guy's over there just driving nails like mad. A couple hits, it was in. A couple hits, and nailing up. And I couldn't nail up at the time. And I was like, you, you do this on a regular basis? He says, if you do it on a regular basis, you'll be able to do it as well. So a lot of times the people who haven't been involved with struggle, haven't been involved with hardship, haven't, they, they, they kind of want to bail on it real quick. You'll, you'll see that in churches. You'll see that people will come to church when everything's exciting and the church is growing and, and it's all fun. But when it gets a little bit tough, you'll see a lot of people say, I'm not here for the fight. And they'll just kind of back out. Not that it would be a fight, but that's been my experience in some Baptist churches, that things can get a little bit fuzzy, a little bit hairy. Sometimes people say things in such a way that you think, there's some other meaning in that. You ever been around that? And so people want to kind of get out of the situation because they don't have to be in the situation. Well, that's kind of the picture we get of John Mark. 
He bailed on them in Pamphylia. Well, you get on down into Acts chapter 13, and Paul and Barnabas come, they talk to the church council, and while they're there talking to the church council, they tell about all the great things that God was doing, and they, and they made the decree that, you know, we, we need to tell the Gentiles that, you know, they need to not eat things strangled and, and you know, uh, uh, abstain from worshiping idols and things like that. And so Paul and Barnabas go back to headquarters in Antioch, and while they're there, they decide amongst themselves, let's go out again. Let's revisit these churches that we've already, let's go see the brothers again, and let's go do this. And Paul was like, yeah, let's go do this. Church of Antioch had said, yeah, we'd like for y'all to do this. And Barnabas said, hey, how about we take John Mark? And Paul said, um, how about no? You do know that he bailed on us, and he ran away from the work. He quit the ministry. I don't want him coming with me. Now, if y'all know Paul, y'all know Paul was pretty blunt, right? He said, I don't want him. He's of no use. Barnabas, maybe because he was related, related, but Barnabas is an encourager. You see that through Scripture, that Barnabas was the encourager. Matter of fact, Barnabas encouraged Paul when nobody wanted anything to do with Paul because he'd been responsible for killing some of the saints. And Barnabas said, I think John Mark has a lot of value. Paul said, don't want him with me. So Paul and Barnabas split up over John Mark. They quit working together. We don't really have a lot of recorded extra stuff about how Paul and Barnabas ever made amends. We, we don't have that in Scripture. What we have is that Paul picks up a new headliner, Silas. And we know about Paul and Silas in prison and singing. And Silas was a, was a formidable worker with Paul. And so we go through the rest of the book of Acts and we're focused on Paul and his ministry. Not a lot on Barnabas. Yet Barnabas kept doing what Barnabas did. But there's something interesting in there that by the time you get further down in the New Testament. So you got Paul, maybe 30, 40, 50 years of ministry, and then you have 2 Timothy. And we know about Paul's ministry. We know about his writings. We know about how, how he would go to these churches and he would be there for a while and he would teach them and he would grow them and he'd write theological treatises back to them, telling them how to conduct herself. And all along, we don't hear anything really else about Mark. Not a lot. Matter of fact, so much so that we have a lot of debates on what all did Mark do. Who is Mark and John Mark? Are they the same person? It, we just, you know, there's a whole, because he's sliding in and out of the timeline until we get to 2 Timothy, which is kind of the purpose for today. In 2 Timothy, I hope I've got it turned there. Of course I don't. I'm over an axe. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is closing out, closing out his life. He's closing out his ministry. He's telling Timothy, I need to do a couple things. He's also reflecting on the situation he's caught in. So down about verse 6, he says, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He's speaking of his death. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, that's, that's a great statement, isn't it? Paul had confidence in that. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but all those who have loved his appearing. So this is the close. Of, this is kind of one of those, this is funerary verses that, that you know, a lot of us like to use for those. Then chapter, verse 9, here, here's where he gets really personal. He says, Do your best to come to me soon. So he's writing to Peter, I mean Timothy. We don't know exactly where Timothy is, is, is at this time. I still suspect he may be in Ephesus, but it's not apropos to today. So he says, do your best to come to me soon. You better, you better come quickly. He's already said the time of my departure is at hand. He's probably in a dungeon-like situation. It, it's, it's not a real good situation. Or, or He's still locked up in this home that he had to rent, but his health is failing him, and, and, and he knows his time of departure soon. And he says, For Demas, in love with this present world, has, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Okay. He's naming names, isn't he? Demas has abandoned me. He loved the things of this world more than he did the love or the care of the churches. He has bailed. Of course, Paul was, you know, he was in jail. He was, he was a lightning rod. A lot of people didn't want to be around Paul. They wanted a more comfortable, more pleasing life easier paul's or being around paul was difficult so he he throws demons under the bus there and then he writes christians has gone to galatia 
Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. So you, can, you kind of hear the desperation in Paul? It's just Luke. Now, we know that Luke adored Paul because if you've read Acts, you realize that his, he focused on Paul throughout all that. I mean, he just loved Paul, loved serving with Paul. And so here Paul is down, on, down in the dumps. He's at the end of things. He begs Timothy to come to him as soon as he can. He wants him to bring a robe because it's getting cold. He wants him to bring the parchment, some of his writings. Um, and so this is where it, 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 this is the thin part of life where you only are going to write down and say what's important. Luke is alone with me, verse 11. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me in the ministry. Mark makes a, a showing. Now, if, if you haven't been following closely while reading the New Testament, you may miss that this is the same John Mark that abandoned them in Pamphylia. This is the same John Mark that he and Barnabas fought about. This is the same John Mark that they broke up with one another over. You, you, may, you may read that and think, who is this John Mark? But, but if you go back and trace the steps through there, you'll see that John Mark had some very interesting character qualities that aren't really listed. Now, we have that Paul was angry with him. Maybe he was a rich, young, spoiled kid and just didn't like to struggle. Well, they went to Cyprus. Not a lot of souls got saved. Paul's always being threatened with death. Maybe he's the young man that ran out of his robes in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's the, the rich, Mary, rich woman's son. He may have had things handed to him and life was easy. We just don't know all of that. We, we piece it together. But here's what we do know. He bailed on the ministry. You ever met anybody like that? Truthfully, honestly, you, you, you meet people all the time that bail on the ministry. If you understand that we're all called to be ministers, right? We're all called to serve God in the kingdom. There's a lot of people that, well, a church can have a struggle, a church can have a fight, a church can have a disagreement. And like I said earlier, they just they don't want to be a part of that no more. So, so here's John Mark. He was an under rower. You know what? The under rower is the servant we talked about. The one that had the unpleasant job. The one that made sure things happened and they got done the way they would. So that basically, the, if you would, the star of the show or, or those that, that, that went and were doing the preaching and things like that. So that their job could be taken care of. And then so th they're relying on him and he bails. Barnabas takes his side and, and Paul says, well, if that's how it's going to be, I don't want to part with you either. I mean, they, they split up. Something happened, though. I put forward to you today that I think Mark was courageous. Could you imagine Paul being against you? I mean, you're trying to do the work of the kingdom the best way that you know how, yet Paul doesn't like you. You reckon everybody knew that? I mean, by the time they were reading the book of Acts... Paul was still alive in the ending of the book of Acts. And so by the time they're reading the book of Acts, they're like, John Mark, I've heard of him. And he just bailed on them. You ever, you ever think about somebody from high school that you just don't care for them? Haven't seen them in 60 years, but you just don't care for them, right? Because you've got a snapshot in your mind of you walking down the hall one day and they kicked your foot and it went behind your heel and you stumbled. Everybody looked at you and laughed. Or... They just didn't have any use for you. You wanted to be there. For, we all got pictures of people, snapshots. We remember them being whatever they were, and we still don't like them. Now, maybe you're not like me. Maybe you get over things like that, but there's still people in high school. I don't care if I see them because of how they were in high school. It's been 40 years. But I still think about who they were in high school. Anybody different than they were in high school? Yeah. Anybody regret who they were in high school a little bit no i see some head shaking no loved it lived up to the potential right anybody ever say anything to somebody way back when you think about today and your stomach goes oh did you really say that see i, I have that every once in a while i really did that i really said that so you can imagine that when paul makes his feelings known to the church at Antioch by the way that's the mother church basically that's where all the missionary efforts were coming from they were the church that were on top of everything you know they were first called Christians at Antioch and it was a derogatory term yet the Christians said hey that works we'll call ourselves Christians that that all that's coming from Antioch so it's kind of the you know things are happening 
in this spot and the word is traveling and the word gets out that John Mark ran out on Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas said, John Mark has potential. I'm going to work with John Mark, just like he did Paul. And you know what John Mark had to decide? He had to decide that the cause was bigger than Paul's degrading of him. He had to decide that the cause was bigger, the purpose that he was involved in was bigger than the lowly status he had acquired by running out on them. He had to, he had to decide that, you know what, I'm going to stay at this task. I'm going to stay. So by the time we skip all those years at Paul's ministry, not hearing a lot about John Mark, he shows back up and Paul says, bring John Mark to me because he's a benefit to me in the ministry. See, John Mark had to stay courageous. He had to say, even though it's stacked against me, even though it's troublesome, even though it's a struggle, I'm going to keep doing what I'm called to do. And that's hard to do, isn't it? When it kind of appears to be stacked against you. And sometimes that's the role of a deacon. The deacon can get accolades and the deacon can get accusations just as easily. I've even had a lady one time, uh, we had a bunch of Sunday school teachers that wouldn't show up and teach your classes. And so I made a statement. I said, well, what would y'all do if I just didn't show up to preach? And she said, well, I'd let the deacons know and I wouldn't pay you that week. Happened to be the treasurer. It wasn't here. And I'm like, let the deacons know. Let, let the under rowers know. See, we've got that flipped over in a lot of Baptist circles. We've elevated the, the role of deacon to a, a leader and a head of things. And not the word deacon means servant, as we've talked about many times. And so it's, it's not easy to be a deacon. Because at the moment a church is looking for a pastor, who do they go to? A lot of times they go to the deacons. So what are you all doing? In a lot of churches, the deacons are the ones that, that find the next pastor. And so they go into the process, and it takes a long time. Can I get an amen? It takes a long time, but church folk don't want to wait. So they're always, what are y'all doing? Are y'all doing anything at all? Or you get that question, well, what, do, what do the deacons actually do? And that's never an encouraging question. That's never, it's like, you know. If, if you don't know what they do, they're probably doing their job. But we don't like that because we want stuff to be... So it's, it's hard to be courageous. Not only was he courageous, though, but you can tell by the story that he... he can uh, Come over to get my Bible. It's down there. <laughs> so that happens. He was committed. He was courageous. And he was committed to the task. He had to stay in the ministry, but he also had to stay in the ministry long enough to become beneficial to the one that didn't like him. And that's hard to do. Think about people in your life that don't like you. Anybody ever had somebody you could never win over? Yeah, I've had that. You just can't win them over. No matter what, you can't win them over. They just, you know, there's always something. You, you could absolutely do something that's absolutely phenomenal, and they'll say, well, why did it take so long? Why didn't we do that the first time? I mean, it's some people just don't have a, 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 an ounce of praise in them. Um, have you ever heard the saying, what do you want, a cookie? That's exactly what that means. You do something, you feel good about it, and they're like, that's just normal. Nothing, nothing special here. You know, we all need people in our life keeps us humble, Amen. But we also need a mama in our life that's going to encourage us and say, you're, you're just the greatest thing since sliced bread. We need both, don't we? Well, John Mark had Barnabas in his life. And I don't know how long their relationship worked and how it... But he, he was committed. He was absolutely committed to the cause of Christ. Therefore, Paul could say, all those decades later, bring with you John Mark. He's beneficial to me in the ministry think about that for paul who's been abandoned by everybody including demas in this very passage and just luke the physician is with him oh timothy come quickly and when you come could you please bring john mark he means a lot to me that's a pretty good turnaround isn't it he was courageous and he was committed but you know the greatest thing about it is he continued he continued to do the maybe at times thankless task that he had to do. 
I'd say it's thankless right off the bat when he's going around and he was going to help a, a, a gathering of believers somewhere and he was assisting them and helping them and they say, well, you're, you're a lot of help. Who are you? I am John Mark. They'll be like, no. The John Mark that Paul didn't like? Yeah. Can you imagine carrying that moniker around with you? He continued in the work. And that's what we're looking at when we think about Deacon Emeritus. Deacons should work behind the scene. Deacons should do what deacons do. Whether you know what they do or not, the deacons do what they do. They have a role given to us in Scripture. The first Timothy talks about the role of a deacon. It's important. It's a God-given role. It's, a, it's something that the Bible lists as one of the functions and one of the, one of the groups inside of a church. You have deacons. But to be a deacon and to serve well as a deacon. You know, the Bible says that deacons that serve well are, are worthy of honor. To serve well as a deacon is hard to do because there are expectations you can't possibly meet. And at the same time, anything that fails, it's probably your fault. That's just kind of how it goes, especially in Baptist churches. And not here, but in a lot of churches, it's that way. Um, to serve continually. That's another hard one. You ever seen deacons quit? I mean, quit the church, quit the deaconship, um, quit going, quit praying, quit reading, because they had to deal with church people, primarily, or their own family, or the people in their lives. It's, it's hard to be a continuous. So you don't do a lot of deacon emeritus in churches. Because, first of all, a lot of young men like to bail on the job. It's tough. It's hard. Older men, they get lax. They're tired of going to deacons meetings. You ever heard that? Oh, another deacon meeting? What are we going to do? I've seen that throughout my ministry. Then every once in a while, there's a John Mark. A John Mark is somebody who even through the opposition, even through the struggles, even through the hard times, they stay at the task. They continue. They're courageous. They're committed. And that's what we want to recognize today as a church. Harold Robinson served since I've been here um, up until just recently as the chairman of deacons. What a title, right? Deacon chair. Um, hard task. Hard task. Has you ever, you ever tried to herd cats? Chairing deacons is the same way, trying to herd cats, trying to get people, everybody has an opinion, and, and try to get together and have a meeting that has some sort of profit and outcome is, is difficult. But, but Harold has served and served as a deacon for over 11 years. Um, Brother Bill ordained you right here, didn't he? Yeah. Um, a little over 11 years ago, Brother Bill Hartung ordained him as a deacon. Uh, he had served, he had been around Bill in, in, in other, at Thornhill and different places, and they, they knew one another, and they were friends. Um, Brother Bill saw something in Brother Harold, and I'll have to concur with Brother Bill. He was right. He was right. Uh, Harold has been one that since I've been here, when I first came, um, I learned, like, right off the bat. At first, me and Susan would bounce around to different Sunday school classes just to kind of see how things were functioning and, and how the teachers taught and things. Not judging, just wanted to know, get a feel for the church and the people of the church. And we sat down in one Sunday school class, and Brother Harold was in that class, and somebody else was teaching that day, or, or um, the regular teacher wasn't there. And they began talking about a conspiracy. Now, I'm not going to go into the conspiracy at that time, but... The, the statement was made, they say, okay, you've heard people say that, they say that this has happened. And I thought, okay, here we go, this is going to be an interesting Sunday school hour. And about that time, Harold said, well, who is they? I thought, okay. And so the other person torted back that, well, it's, it's the people that are in the know. And Well, who are they, though? Well, they're the ones that are saying this. But who is, the, and it was interesting, a five-minute little dialogue there, and I thought, Brother Harold has some gumption about him. 
he, he's, he's willing to at least say there's something wrong with your argument. Can you clarify a little bit? Can you go a little further with that argument? And so I thought, I like Brother Harold. I, I, right off the bat, I, I liked him because he's, he's going to call, I'm not going to say it that way, he's going to call junk speech when he hears junk, junk speech. He's going to make you say, can you clarify? I, I love that about somebody. I don't have that kind of gumption in me. A lot of times I just let people spew whatever, and I just go away thinking, what an idiot. <laughs> but see, Harold sees the value in speech. He, he, he's like, let's dialogue. Who is they? Can we find a place to meet where we can discuss this? And, and, I, and I've seen Harold have deacon meetings, and, and we'll get together, and we're not sure what we're going to be doing or, or how we're going to go about it. I always like to attend the deacon's meetings and, and, and you know, make this plan and make that plan, and, and how do we think things are going? Is there anything we as deacons can do to, to help out and supplement in this area? And things? And this is a difficult church to be a deacon in because the, the traditional roles of deacon as given, what, given in Scripture have been taken over in, in a lot of Southern Baptist churches by committees. And so the things that the deacons were doing right off the bat aren't really needed to be done because there's a committee to take over. But that doesn't mean that we get rid of a bit of biblical you know, order that God's given us to have deacons. But you're sitting there thinking, what can we do? And yet through that, Harold stayed. He was committed. He was committed to being chairman. He, he was committed to see things done and to see how we could help out. Find a place that needs a hand and lend a hand. Amen? And so that's why I say you don't see a lot of deacon emeritus in churches. Now, Brother Bill would say, and I've heard him say it, that this means you're being put out to pasture. Not what that means. Deacon emeritus, not that I disagree with Bill, I, he had a turn of phrase that was funny. What this means is that we as a church, and we as a deacon body, and I, I serve on the deacon fellowship as well, we as a church recognize service. And we want to say, as Paul said, send me Harold because he's beneficial to the ministry. If you're going to bring anybody with you, bring this guy with you. That's a big deal, isn't it? I mean, John Mark can be not known by most Christians that live in the 21st century. But Paul knew exactly the benefit of John Mark. And he says, hey, hey, Timothy, I love you, brother. I love you, Timothy. You're like a son to me. But when you come, bring John Mark because he helps me in the ministry. And, and I want to say I picked that verse for today on purpose because Harold has helped me in the ministry. He's, he's, he's got a consistency about him. He's got a regularity about him. He's got a commitment about him. He's got a, a continuation about him that when I think about the over 11 years that he has served as a deacon, that what this means as a deacon emeritus is he doesn't have to be voted on again. He's always a deacon. That's what that means. He's always a deacon. It also means that he can pick and choose if he wants to come to the meetings or not. <laughs> now, I want to argue with you. He earned that because he had to plan the meetings, figure out the meetings, figure out what we're going to talk about, all those things for years and years and years. Now, if we're having a deacon's meeting, he's like, yeah, I won't be there, fellas. I'm playing golf. <laughs> and you know what we still call him? We still call him deacon. That's what that means. Now, and I've told the younger guys that have come on, I said, you all stop coming to meetings, you'll stop being a deacon. If you can't even make that kind of commitment to come to the meeting, if we do nothing and you decide I'm not going to go because nothing ever comes to the meeting, you're not deacon material because deacons go through the hard times. Deacons go through the dry times. Deacons go through the tough times. And what do they do? They have a charge. They have a commission. They live up to it. Amen? Just because you get tired of doing something or don't like the way somebody else does it doesn't mean you get to say, well, you're not doing it my way. I quit. That's elementary school. Take my ball and go home, right? But a deacon emeritus means he always carries the title deacon. He's always a deacon. If he wants to come to the meetings, come on. He's always got input. He's always willing to assist. He's always willing to help. He has a few challenges and struggles in life. And I look at the bench there, and I understand why that would. He's probably exhausted. I mean, look at that group, right? 
Can you imagine being part of that? Now, we, we love it that his family's here, and, and, and I tell you what, you want to get Harold going? Ask him about his grandkids. Ask him about his kids. And he wants to talk about what they're doing. Harold has a heart for Christ. Harold has a heart for the church. And Harold has a heart for the kingdom of God. We recognize that just as Paul recognized in John Mark. The commitment. The continuation. That we saw in John Mark. See that in Harold. Harold doesn't always have the answers. He, de he doesn't know, necessarily know what we're going to do going forward. None of us do, so we get together and talk about it. But he's always willing to get together and talk about it. How do we go about it? What, what should we do? What are we thinking? I love that because he's still interested in the work today. And so today as a church, we award him this plaque because of service that's already proven who he is. Amen. Other deacons in here, if you look at this plaque, you think one of these days I want one of these plaques, earn it. Earn it. Consistency is the key. Amen. Brother Harold, if you and Charlotte would come forward. Now, I think there's also concern. I know that Charlotte has issues um, with her lungs. And so we're, we're going to forego any hugging and kissing and all that stuff today um, so that they don't take anything home with them. But I'd like him to come forward. And I would like to present you as pastor, but not only as pastor, as um, interim deacon chair, um, but more than anything, friend. I don't know which one's harder to get along with, Charlotte or Harold. <laughs> Charlotte is, right? God bless you, brother. Thank you for your service. Charlotte, God bless you. I want you all to know that in this household, he is the head. I also want you to know that she's the neck that turns the head. Amen. Can I get a testimony? <laughs> so, brother, I'd like to present you to that so you can have that and you can always look up and realize, it's not as heavy as it looks, is it, that, that you are a deacon in our hearts and in our minds for life. You're the epitome of the role. And we're so thankful to have had you all these years. And we look forward to many, many more years of, of your deacon emeritus status. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. Congratulations. Life is full of decisions. We make them every single day. The decision to be consistent is an important decision. The decision to continue in what the Lord's given you to do is an important decision. We can all look around and see people that aren't here today or maybe not even in church anymore. We can all look around and, and recognize that we saw people that were on fire, willing to charge hell with a water pistol, but something happened, somebody didn't shake their hand, some, and some reason they just drifted away from the church. We've all faced that, though, haven't we? It's consistency in the kingdom. God didn't ask me to be the Messiah. He just asked me to preach his word to his people. That's what we do. We, we're consistent about what God has chosen us to do. And we see that in Harold. Amen? Well, amen. That's the conclusion of our service. But before we go, um, do I? Did I hear a wow? <laughs> because it's, it's before 11, right? Before we go, do you care to lead us in a time of invitation? Okay, as they're coming, preparing for invitation, I, here's, here's the challenge for invitation today. Your invitation is to respond to God's call in your life. It won't be easy. It will be long. There'll be times of dryness. But God's call in your life is the most important thing you can respond to. First and foremost, to becoming a Christian, being his child, to receiving Christ as your Savior. Secondly, to say, I'm in it for life. I'm going to follow my Lord and Savior. It will be tough. Jesus said it would be. Paul proves it out. So does John Mark. It will be tough. It's not easy, but it's worth it every step of the way. So the invitation this morning is to respond to however the Spirit's leading you. If you need to talk to me about any other issue, you're going to have a verse or two to respond. Come down, let me know, and we'll talk, and everybody else will sing. Amen? And we'll keep singing until the Lord's finished working.
Sister, what are we going to sing today? We're going to sing very appropriately. I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Room, uh, room. page 305. Room 305 in your hymnal. <laughs> <laughs> Couple stanzas. <laughs> 